So, uh, my great pleasure, we're going into our five-minute updates. First off is uh, the, the Solway Firth Partnership's very own poster boy, Nick Coomby, who you'll be very familiar with from our various publications and uh, social media channels. But uh, Nick has over 30 years' experience as a landscape uh, architect. He's delivered fantastic coastal projects for us over the years, and we're going to have a quick five minutes from him, please, Nick. Thank you. Hello everyone, I've got five minutes to um, encourage you all to get out to the coast and have a look at seaweeds. And um, we have an uh, amazing number of seaweeds, I think there's about 600 different varieties of seaweeds out there. And uh, I'm not expecting you to go out and identify them all, but uh, I think it's great to get down on the shore and see what you can find. We've been inspired by this, the Big Seaweed Search, which is run by Marine Conservation Society and the Natural History Museum. It's been going for quite a number of years, and we noticed that there weren't very... It was a citizen science or community science project, and we noticed that there weren't very many records coming from the Solway area, despite the fact that we have lots of rocky shores for further out west on both sides, but also lots of seaweeds just growing on the rocky scars in the more intertidal muddy areas. So there's plenty of seaweeds out there to record and report, and uh, so we thought we would create our own little booklet, um, which is free, and you can go and pick it up at the, at the desk over, over there, so please do take it, and it helps you identify some of those seaweeds. Uh, first of all, it, the, the great thing about the easy-to-identify seaweeds is that they're found in zones as you go down the beach, and they've all got very specific characteristics, which make them very easy to identify on the whole. And I might have mentioned already that we've got this really good booklet. <laughs> and, and in it, it runs you through every single one. So you can have a look at six or seven different kind of racks that you get on the seashore and identify them really easily. And maybe even come across some friendly creatures on the way. We're also asking you to... So those, those racks are helping us to look at warming seas and how that's changing and may change the distribution of, of those seashore seaweeds. We're also asking people to look out for invasive species as well, so certainly on the Scottish side further out west we've got this naughty little wireweed that is appearing in various places and expanding quite quickly now, um, so that's one of the things that we're asking people to identify as well, and we've just discovered in the last year that we've also have wakami growing in Stranra, so uh, that's also just arrived and maybe spreading, so we want to keep an eye on that. Uh, we're also interested in those calcified crusts and coral weeds. Uh, they're more interesting because they might be able to give us some clues about how acidification in the ocean is affecting things, and again, it gives you an opportunity to have a real route around in rock pools and see what you can find, and lovely things like this snake locks and enemy, as well as this sort of pink crust that you find on, on the seashore. So uh, just to remind you that we have this fantastic free booklet <laughs> which you can take out which is, uh, it, uh, helps you identify these species. It gives points you in the right direction as to where you can download information of the species that you found to uh, the big seaweed search. Uh, this is funded by Foundation Scotland uh, through the Kilgalliac wind farm money and with Dumfries and Galloway Council. And we've also, because where most are the most exciting seaweeds we've got are on the Rins Coastal Path, so we also have a map of the Rins Coastal Path at the end. So I encourage you to all go out there any time of year. Um, you can find seaweeds. Best to go at low tide. It can be a bit disappointing at high tide. But otherwise, just get out there and have some fun. Thank you. If anything Nick said didn't make sense, we have a free fantastic booklet that you can just grab outside there to uh, make, make sense of it all. Uh, Japanese wakami you can eat, by the way, so that's a good way to get rid of an invasive non-native species. Right, it's my great pleasure to introduce Grant Course from Seascope Fisheries. Grant's career in fisheries began as a cockle fisherman during summer vacations from universities before uh, becoming a seagoing observer for the sea fish industry in 1993. He's worked for several government affiliated departments over the last 30 years, including Seafish, uh, CFAS, and the MMO 
with a career spanning both science and compliance. In 2014, Grant started his own research uh, company, Seascope Fisheries Research, uh, which specialises in bycatch reduction projects and utilising EM technology as the main monitoring tool. Thank you. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so in uh, last year, we... Um, applied for some funding from the DEFRA, and it's called the FISP Fund, which is the Fishing Industry Science Partnership Fund. Um, with that, we had partners to do a project looking at the cockle stocks in the Solway. Uh, the last survey that was done in the Solway for the stocks was in 2015. Um, so every cockle that's ever been surveyed was already dead. So we thought we should try and actually do a survey where we can actually improve the stocks um, and one of the issues with the funding was that uh, it relied on Marine Scotland actually providing the funding to do the surveys, and they didn't have the funding. So we thought if we actually apply for the funding, employ and partner up with Marine Scotland, um, fishing industry, and the University of Glasgow, we could actually help um, this situation and actually improve this stock so it's not a data deficient stock and provide the actual science. Oh. Do I have to do it myself? Um, so the aims of the project are to undertake two annual surveys, one we've just completed in the summer and one next year. Um, we're going to try and do a, a relaying trial, we're calling it, where we're moving smaller cockles to an area to see if it improves the growth on them, um, potentially improves their survivability, because if you've got cockles in a, lot, in a, in a very dense area, they tend to die due to um, stocking density. Um, and we're also involving students when they're going to look at sediment samples, they're going to look at how cockles are aged, because if you've ever tried to age them, you can get into some serious arguments. Um, and then and on top of that, we're going to give the students practical experience in actually doing sampling and things. So the project started in June. Um, um, other parties involved in the project are mainly from a steering group situation. So you have um, the RSPB, SFP, um, Claverick, Nature Scott, everybody's involved in it, um, and there's a lot of stakeholders in the cockles. In my naivety, I thought it'd be quite a simple project, but my goodness. So planning the surveys, that's all been done. Um, we've, you know, so actually go through and getting the permission to even do the survey took quite a considerable amount of time, and we've got some helpers in here. Hi, Carl. So nice, thank you. Um, and we've, we've completed the survey. So the ones in red are what we've still got left to do. Um, I'll move on. That'll take us right through to March 25. So it looks like a quite small area when you put that up there, doesn't it? Um, I walked all of that, and it's huge. It's huge. I think we clocked up something like 200 miles each walking. Um, so that's we're trying to do right from Loose Bay, uh, Wington Bay, sorry, right across to basically Portling, um, and then Powfoot. Uh, this gives you an idea. This is Barnhuri Bank. Um, the green dots are the ones that were actually sampled the first time, and then we went down to, to some additional sampling, which are the pink dots. But you can see there's lots which don't get sampled. Obviously, you don't get cockles in the middle of a field, um, and also you, you can't reach the bits below the, minimum, uh, below the low water mark. Um, so that's been cut off, but basically it just told you that we um, sampled approximately 13,000 cockles were sampled and weighed. Um, and we did that over, I think it was 648 stations. Um, but the relaying side, uh, I don't know if this video will work or not, but it basically shows you that you get a really high density of like one-year-olds. So we think there's probably around 24,000 tons of cockles out there now, based on our data. But of those, the... Um, majority are one-year-olds. So, of course, when you get big banks full of cockles like this, they start to, they start to sort of wash out and they're over-competing in the same area and they, they call it blowout, basically, where they come up to the surface and then get washed away. Um, and the majority of them will die. So we're hoping that potentially if we can um, find out that moving them is a, is a bonus you know, and does help them and a benefit, then we can maybe actually then do it at a slightly larger scale that will improve the stocks. Um, the student projects, as I said, that one of those is going to take sediment samples in high-density areas and low-density areas, and the, the, 
the, the aging one, like I said, just to try and read the rings is quite difficult. And But if you take a cross section, you've got a chance of getting the sort of rings uh, aged a bit better. So, like I said, that's what we're up to so far. Uh, next week we start doing our first part of the relaying trials. Um, and we're looking forward to walking another 200 miles each next year. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, my great pleasure to introduce next uh, from RWE, which are very important funders to the partnership, which we appreciate hugely. Mike Edwards, with a background in industry across chemical process and electrical generation. Mike's an experienced engineer with extensive knowledge in the construction, commissioning, and operation of large power generation projects across the UK. As general manager of RWE Robin Rig Wind Farm, Mike directs a team of specialists in all aspects of 174 megawatt offshore wind farm activities, including safety, operations, maintenance, and commercial performance. Mike. quiet. Um, so um, I suppose uh, we're the industrial side of the Solway, I think, really, um, and probably the most visible thing you see if you look out over the Solway. So it's quite an important um, opportunity for us to, to, to reach out and meet, meet our stakeholders. Um, again, I've got to remember to move this on, and I'm assuming it's that bus. Uh, so I thought I'd talk about five things that we've done, uh, or environmental facts around Robin Rig. Opportunity to talk about something that's completely different to something I normally do, because we, I, if I'm in a room like this, it tends to be engineers, um, and they don't want to know this sort of stuff. It's how do things actually work. Um, so a slightly different um, uh, talk today. So five facts, um, and, and sort of a, a bit of a, an idea of some of the challenges that we, that we face working a bit further offshore than most people have been talking about today, so we're a bit, bit further out. Um, Robin Rig's an inshore wind farm, by the way, so um, if, you, if you ever talk about wind farms, we're inshore, um, although it doesn't seem it when, you, when you're looking out there. So in terms of power generation, um, clearly we're not burning anything, so we've, we've, we've converted to, uh, to, to wind power these days, um, and, and I suppose it's the easy one to talk about is those, is those emissions, and that's, that, you know, I won't read out the numbers, but it's a big number, and that's the sort of thing we're, we're, we're working with here. So for an equivalent gas-fired power station to operate, that's the sort of levels of CO2 they'd be pumping into the atmosphere. So in terms of generation, when we've got our wind farms operating, these are the these are the sort of values we're stopping um, entering the atmosphere. And we've been talking early on about the, the, the stripe model of, of um, heat over the last, um, what was it, a couple of hundred years or whatever it was, um, and, and you start to see how important these, these, um, these wind farms actually are becoming. Oh, did that work? There we go. Um, and in terms of supply chain, and I think that's a really important thing to talk about. So whilst I'm not talking about a particular value in... Um, in CO2 or, or, or our carbon footprint, what I did want to point out here is how we try and keep everything local. And that's one of the, one of the things I think is really good about specifically RWE is when we talk about our supply chain, we try and keep that all local. So it's not only about um, using local people, but trying to reduce that carbon footprint. So most of our, our, our products that we use or buy in or, um, uh, and services, and that includes people and components, will come from the UK, so about 86% I think I've put up there. So quite a significant number come from the UK alone, and about 45, nearly 50% comes from either Cumbria or the Scottish area, and that includes all our staff as well. So we, we don't bring in a lot of additional people or, or components from abroad. So we're trying to always reduce our carbon footprint and that impact that we have. In terms of ornithology, I don't think I've got a picture, but um, <laughs> we... We often get this story of, of um, how uh, the, the wind farms um, are actually bad for, for, for the bird life. Um, I, I actually spend an inordinate amount of money cleaning bird guano off of turbines. I have a team dedicated to that job. Um, they're, they, they're, it's not the nicest job, um, but the guys are a pretty, pretty tight-knit unit, um, and they have to go out and clean off all those nice yellow bits where our guys have to climb uh, that's obviously we can't kind of guys climbing through guano. So I have a team that actually uh, that actually goes and um, uh, cleans all that, that off. It's it's really great actually. So we do quite a bit of work. Obviously, we, there's certain areas we don't want birds on, and the yellow bit is where we climb. So we try we try and discourage them. But what we do is then have other areas where we do encourage them. So we have a, a stub that we we encourage them to uh, to, to nest on. And we have um, poles hanging out the side of the turbines where we encourage them to land. So they're further away from our active areas, but they're all encouraged to, to join us. 
And in terms of the reef, so there is a reef, it's um, mostly around the base of the turbines. Um, but we do, we do uh, have a number of, of uh, mussels, starfish, and of course, subsequently, fish, uh, fish that are attracted to, to those areas. Um, that picture was actually taken um, not long after the build of the wind farm, but I do have some more recent pictures from our divers, so we do send divers down into the water, and they, they get an opportunity to see a lot of this live, um, live activity that's going on. And it's, and it's really exciting to see when we get the videos back from the divers. And then finally, one of the sort of challenges we have is, is getting that road to net zero. And it is a big challenge for us. Um, I, our biggest um, impact is our vessels. They're, they're quite difficult to, to convert to um, uh, carbon neutral. But um, as, as a business, RWE are driving, driving to uh, net zero as a whole business by, by 2040, but specifically the renewable section, which is the department I work for, by 2030. About 90% probably of my, our, our output is, um, is through the vessels. So by changing those, we can, we can make a big impact very quickly. So at the moment, we're modeling a couple of options, and those are mostly around um, moving to vegetable oil fuels and uh, battery operated or electrically operated vessels. They're in model stage at the moment, but as you can see, we haven't got very long. So those challenges are there, and they're very real for us to drive to net zero is, is, is our big push for for the next um, sort of four or five years. So there's a very quick whistle-stop tour. Oh, I haven't got any questions. I'm moving on, I think, aren't I? We're going to go to the next one. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, Mike. Yep, hold the questions. We've got the last of our five minutes. Gives me great pleasure to introduce David Gibson. He's the Senior Countryside Officer for Cumberland uh, Council. Uh, since graduating, David has worked for the past 25 years in countryside management in both Cumbria and Yorkshire. During that time, he's gained a wide variety of experience in the practical delivery of countryside management, uh, multi-user roles, and general duty in the maintenance of rights of way. Since 2009, David has been working in partnership with Natural England on the delivery of the King Charles III England Coast Path, a new national trail around the whole coast of England. David. Some of it works, that's all I think. I, I once did one of these things where I didn't have much time to do it and I clicked the first button and the projector went out and I had to add a lead my way through it. So <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, you, you suffer from it ever since. So just a quick whiz through the <coughs> King Charles III England Coastal Path. Uh, it's uh, one we've been developing now for some time with our partners, uh, Natural England, on this, and uh, very much involved in the Solway area at the moment where it's, where it's coming through. Ooh, oh no. The actual route itself, it's going to be a national trail. It was established by the Marine and Coastal Access Act, which I've heard a number of people get in spin-offs today about that. Uh, with, like I said, I'm working in partnership with Natural England to put this in. It's very much Natural England driven for a start. It's something where Natural England have actually been challenged by the Secretary of State to go out and consult with the landowners, put a line on a map, and then that then goes back to the Secretary of State. So then that's pass to that's where the alignment's going to be. That's when we get involved after they've finished all the argument and pointing and gesturing with each other. We get involved on that to where there's kind of um, conservation issues. That's been a, a lot of it around the coast. When I heard about natterjack toads, I used to have nightmares about natterjack toads. <laughs> um, so we're doing that. Uh, once that's the, we get that line on a map, then it comes to us for the actual establishment of it. The establishment's funded 100% again by Natural England, so that's uh, a Brucey bonus for the council when that comes in, because that allows my staff and contractors to go out there and put it in 100% funded. It's all opened in stages. Uh, was Cumbria where it was all opened in stages? Uh, we're still opening in stages, but we have a little bit less to do now. Uh, the first of the 36 k's that we actually opened up was the Whitehaven to Allenby section. 
very good that section because it had everything that was going to come across later on in there. Uh, erosion, sand dunes, natty jack toads, uh, common land, scheduled ancient monuments, and somehow we have to create a, a, an actual area of open access through there, which is going to be called the National Trail, and it's going to be used by many. We were the first of six in the country to start addressing this in a pilot scheme that they actually put together, and so it was really a baptism by a fire, especially when we got the storms and it washed all the sand dunes out at Cross Canonby, and before it was actually opened, we had it all to move. Uh, the sections that we've got open again is like uh, Allenby to White, Whitehaven that we've actually mentioned. That's opened up. There's another section we've done from Whitehaven right down to Silecroft. The Allenby one was quite good because a lot of big landowners in there, council being some of the big landowners, so there wasn't a lot of issue with that one. Whitehaven to Silecroft was a very different animal when we got down there because there was all the little crofting fields that went down to half a mile you'd have about 20 landowners it was it was terrible all the kest hedges to go through all the negotiations to do so you're not mixing the livestock up so it was quite an exciting time we then did another section from Silecroft to Green Road Station which takes us to the Cumberland boundary uh, we also did a section which is now in Westmoreland and Furness and we created a, a new trail right around uh, Walney Island uh, sections that are currently being established, I mentioned that it came once we got rid of all the problems. Well, there still are some problems in areas. Uh, the been to public inquiry of Natural England over uh, a, a sh the short section uh, from Beaumont to Abbey Town, and so that's being dealt with at the moment. We're hoping that that's going to come through and maybe next summer we'll start addressing that and putting that one in on the ground. The other bit that is outstanding, and as you can see up there, that's going to be opened on the 23rd of November. Uh, it has been a slightly delay on that, but uh, hopefully then the 23rd, which is coming up pretty shortly, there's still a bridge to go in, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll get there with that as well. All this effort is kind of well spent because we've got something in there that was touched in in the, the general speak round and that's generating income, getting people into the area. All national trails have an economic value because we spread the net quite widely, worldwide for most national trails as we've learnt by monitoring the users that did it. Hadrian's Wall Path is one that we've established historically in the, in the north of the region. Yes, it's got that magnet of the Hadrian's Wall Trail because people haven't found out how beautiful the coastline is in Cumberland yet. They've yet to come. But that has people in the area for two days and that generates close to two million pounds worth of funding. Yes, it may not be as popular. Hadrian's Wall pop wasn't popular when it started. So we've got this thing where we're going to have people for, are going to be in the county for a week and a half and they're going to be walking up the coast. So the actual money that they're actually going to bring in is going to be the biggest asset, I think, of it. Thank you very much. I just want to stay here for a second, David. Thank you. Right, we do, we do have time for some questions for uh, actually all. That's Nick, Grant, Mike and... Uh, David, and we've got an online question start, have we? Yes, yeah, sorry. I thought you were waving at me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she wasn't waving, she was drowning. <laughs> right, do we have a question from the floor at all? Yes, uh, let's start with Monique, please, and the table there. Is Monique the only Dutch person in the room? 
by the way. We, it's fantastic. I believe we've got someone from the Ukraine here as well. It's great to have you know, these in-person events Spain, and have Spain. this variety. And we've got somebody from Spain as well. So and from Spain. There we go. So, yeah. Thanks. Monique, Belgium. your question, please. Well, there you go. <laughs> right, international. Um, a question for Mike. Um, actually, yes. Um, in the Netherlands, um, I recently heard that the windmills sometimes get stopped when there is an expectation of a big flock of birds going through. Have you heard of that and would you be willing to do that? Um, so, yeah, yes, I think um, it, it's not something we do and it's not something our, our sort of we're, we're forced to do. And I suppose, I suppose for us, the, the other thing as well is we don't tend to get big flocks coming through. Um, so it wouldn't be something we'd probably need to do. Um, but yeah, so something we'd certainly look at. And, and I know some of our European sites do do have those um, do have those big flocks going through, and they do stop. But in general, we don't see that. It's more smaller, smaller five, six, maybe ten birds will travel through, but not large flocks. But yeah, something we could consider if there was a is a need. And I know some of our, our European sites do do that. Hello, um, it's a question for Grant about the cockles, actually, uh, Kipford. When you go to Kipford, it's metres deep in dead cockle shells. And I tried to find out how long this had been going on. Um, I asked somebody in the parish council, do, do you have any information? It's presumably been decades, if not longer. And why? Well, so it's not linked to fishing, because the fishing's been yeah. banned since 2009. Um, but it is drink, drink, uh, sorry, linked to sort of cyclical events, basically. So when you get that over density of the one-year-olds you'll get a small die-off you've got a big die-off sorry of the small cockles but when you get the bigger cockles dying it's because they're not being harvested so everything that would normally have been harvested is washing up dead on so they only grow to six years old say it's that big so anything that sort of size is washing up naturally because it's just dying but then you also get the environmental events like a, a hard freeze that'll kill them hot summers that'll kill them most things kill them they're like sheep, basically, you know. So, it's very but, impressive. But, it, but, it, but it, so it is a natural thing. But it's so the fishermen are arguing that they would like to see themselves harvest some of that before it dies, but in a sustainable way. So that's why we're doing this stock assessment surveys, so we can work out how much is there, what size it is, and what could safely, potentially, in the future, five, ten years down the line, be harvested in a very well managed, controlled fishery. Fantastic. Interesting. Well done. Got last, last question at the back, please. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, Frank Morby, um, Carlisle Naturistic Society. Um, when the coastal path was first put in many years ago, I expressed great concerns for the geese that use the marshes, particularly in the autumn and winter, because it only takes one person to put the whole flock up and they'll move. Um, if the path's going across the marshes, it would worry me greatly that a stream of people is just going to keep the geese off the marshes and then the farms are going to be complaining because the geese are in the grass. We've had uh, quite a lot of rerouting when we've been in consultation with Natural England's conservation unit about uh, breaking the skyline and dis disturbance of birds. Uh, this has been taken into consideration with it uh, around the Amphorn to Drumbruff area where the most of it there stays actually off the marsh and follows the road because it through bird disturbance. Guys, thank you very much. Uh, obviously, if you didn't get a chance to ask Nick a question, if you want to grab one of the free booklets on your way out, uh, it's, it's all there.